Jackie Bird. She was the one who gave me the bone marrow transplant. Save a life while you can in your lifetime. My name is Jeanette Carter, and I'm a scholarship coordinator at the Congressional Black um, Caucus Foundation. Um, at the foundation, we offered uh, eight different scholarship programs that I manage, and I want to thank you guys for coming here um, as part of the Emerging Leader Series, which is an 18 to 35 demographic here at the annual Institute Conference. Um, today's session, entitled IOU, IO University, Higher Education Funding in the Current Economic Climate, um, we'll talk about college access, quality, and affordability under the, under the current <coughs> economic conditions. This is particularly important considering that last year the median borrower graduated owing about $20,000. This combined with, this combined with the current recession um, <laughs> equates to thousands of students going back to school, which makes this topic um, especially relevant to us. Today we have a very important and interesting panel. Um, I had the opportunity to speak with them last week. And one of the questions they asked me was, what do I think the um, profile is of a person who's attending this session? And as I began describing it, I thought, wow, um, that the profile is actually myself in different parts of my life. So I thought about me at 17. I'm a first generation college student. Um, and as I was going to college, I didn't know how I was going to pay for it, so my parents didn't necessarily save up money for it. Um, I got into some really good schools. Um, the school I ended up going to was number two in networking, had a great sports team. So it was a really great school, and along with that, it was really, really expensive. Um, by the time I graduated, my school was actually number one in most that approved by a student um, upon graduation. And I actually personally helped to, uh, to add to that. Um, as a college graduate, I had to consider what kind of job I was going to get. So the whole point of going to college is that you um, get an education and you end up making a lot of money in the end. But can you really work at what you really want to do when you're worrying about how you're going to pay for your student loans? With that, you have to consider how you're going to pay for your daily expenses as well as pay off your student loans. I also went to grad school, and with that, I had to consider whether or not I was going to continue investing into my education or, um, and what the return on investment was going to be for that. And now I work as a scholarship coordinator where I provide funding for students. So on this side, I'm thinking about what kind of programs are available to students, how do they get them, and how do they find out about them. And I believe that today's panel will help answer a lot of the questions that I previously had, as well as um, the questions we have now. And if you guys are anything like me, I think that you guys probably have the same questions. Before we get started, I wanted to let you guys know that today's session wouldn't be possible without the help of our sponsor, um, Walmart Stores Incorporated. And I believe a rep will be joining us later today, um, and at that time they'll come to the stage and give us greetings. Today's moderator is someone who I think can speak from both a policy professional side as well as um, personally from the student side. He's held research posts at the Institute for Higher Education Policy, the National Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators, and most recently at the Pell Institute for the Study of, Opp for the study of Opportunity. Currently, he's a full-time doctoral student at the University of Maryland College Park in the Higher Education Program. Please welcome Ryan Davis. moderating the discussion with our four esteemed panelists today, and uh, after I provide a brief introduction to each panelist, they're going to um, individually go uh, into more depth about their background, their experiences, how they got to where they were, um, uh, some of their expert areas of expertise in the work that, uh, that they're, for which they're engaged, uh, and how those all intersect. So, after uh, they talk a little bit more about their background and area of expertise. Um, I'll then ask the panel some questions to stimulate dialogue. And once that happens, um, throughout, throughout the course of me asking questions, you're welcome to, to uh, intervene if you have uh, particular questions or need clarification or anything. But um, I'm going to go through a series of questions, and after that, we have a wireless microphone that will be going around, and um, we'll get into a Q&A session at that point. So, uh, our first panelist, Dr. Michelle Asher Cooper, is the president at the Institute for Higher Education Policy. 
She's an emerging and respected leader who believes in ensuring equal educational opportunities, particularly for underrepresented groups, is a moral and social imperative. She is intent on using IHEP's initiatives as a springboard to better inform the policymaking process on key education, educational issue, issues such as academic preparation and college readiness, college costs and financial aid, accountability, state and institutional financing and capacity. Our second panelist is Mr. Ken Redd. Mr. Redd is the Director of Research and Policy Analysis at the National Association of College and University Business Officers. Mr. Redd is an expert on student financial aid and enrollment and financing trends in higher education who has focused most of his intellectual efforts towards understanding factors that lead to student success. His research interests include student enrollments and degrees conferred, along with student financial support for undergraduate and graduate students. The Chronicle of Higher Education uh, named Mr. Redd one of the top 10 up and coming new thinkers in higher education. Ken is going to talk about uh, a little bit about trends in, and borrowing, especially for African American students. Our third panelist, uh, Zakia Smith, is a policy advisor in the office of the Undersecretary in the Department of Education. Prior to her position, Ms. Smith served as a Director of Government Relations for the Advisory Committee on Student Financial Assistance, where she advised Congress and the Secretary of Education on higher education policies that would promote college access and success among low and moderate income students specifically through student financial aid policy. She has a master's degree in educational policy and management from the Harvard Graduate School of Education and is a former CBCF intern. Our fourth panelist, Ms. Dawn McCoy, is the director of special markets in the Virginia, Virginia Center at the Education Credit and Management Corporation. There she oversees the regional office in Richmond and supports government and community relations as well as strategic sales and marketing initiatives. Prior to arriving at ECMC, uh, Ms. McCoy worked with the College Board Education Loan Program, Ed Fund, and the National Association of College and University Business Officers. In November 2002, Ms. McCoy was one of the youngest African Americans elected to the Sacramento City Unified School Board of Trustees on her uh, first attempt running for public office. So that's our panelists, and um, Michelle, do you want to come up and talk about some trends in college access and affordability? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So I'm Michelle Lasha-Cooper, and I'm with the Institute for Higher Education Policy. Uh, we commonly call ourselves IHEP, and we are an independent, nonpartisan policy research center located here in Washington, D.C. And during my conversation, my talk, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing at IHEP. And uh, also there were some uh, materials provided by our organization that you can find on the table right outside of the door. So I am honored to be here. Um, I've been t attending these different sessions uh, that have been a part of the annual CBC Legislative Weekend for quite some time. So it's truly an honor to have been invited as a panelist this year. And I want to thank Jeanette for that invitation. Um, I've lived in Washington, D.C. for about nine years working in the policy arena. And uh, before that, I spent some time actually working on the college campus. And I think most people who know me from this policy context tend to not realize that I spent four years kind of working hands-on with students in some of the trenches, for the lack of a better word, doing some very difficult but very important work. I was a director of multicultural and international affairs at a college in Pennsylvania, Wilkes Ferry, Pennsylvania, to be exact. Anyone knows where that is? So if you know where Wilkes Ferry is, <laughs> most people don't know it. And no offense to Wilkes Ferry, if you've never been there, you've not missed much. But it was um, an interesting place to work, and it was a very interesting place to work in the context of diversity and trying to work to better the, the lives of the low income and minority students that came to that institution. So a lot of what I've done along the way, I've had that experience sort of setting the stage for my work. Um, I've always enjoyed these sessions, and like I said, when I come to them, I often feel as if I've been able to get my batteries recharged. So I think a goal for me, as well as the other panelists, is that you will leave here with energy and renewed conviction and more passion than you walk in the door with to do the important work that we all have set out to do today. And we all live and work within close proximity of one another, but we never see each other. <laughs> we never see each other. 
our communication is often by email or by telephone. So I also want to thank CBC for allowing me to see my friends today. And also for my friends who are in the audience, it's good to see you as well. So my role here is really just to set the context, really to tell you about some of the trends that we have seen related to college access, related to college completion, and then the other panelists will go into much more detail about the specifics of financial aid and about financial literacy and some of the policy goals and priorities that are being set forth to address these various initiatives. Uh, the data that I'm pulling from will be some of the data that we have collected and analyzed at my organization, IHEP. And the policy research that we do at IHEP is research that is geared towards helping to effectively change uh, and illuminate some trends in policy. We've worked with policymakers, we've worked with those at the federal level, we work with those at the state level, and a, a growing proportion of our work is focused on doing things internationally as well. We have five areas of focus. One is college access and success. One is accountability, diversity, finances, and global impact. And we also have some programmatic work. And our programmatic work is where we work alongside institutional leaders, those college presidents, faculty, staff, who work in the trenches with the students. Um, most of the institutions we tend to work with have been minority-serving institutions, community colleges, and other institutions that have high proportions of minority and low-income students enrolled on their campuses. So the two reports where I'm drawing some of this research, one is titled Promise Loss. And as promised loss, college qualified students who do not enroll in college. And the other one is titled Aversion to Borrowing. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Jeanette shared with us uh, some of her, her pathways along the, the road and how she got to college and how finances have played a role in her life. I too have a similar story. When I went to college, I did like most students. I searched and searched and applied to all the best institutions in, that I could find all the ones that I love, but when it came down to where I was going, that decision was based solely on money. Solely on money. And I remember the decision, I went to a school that really was a safety school, really wasn't even one that I wanted to go to, to be perfectly honest. But the offer that they gave in terms of finances made the difference in that decision, and I ultimately would have to say has made a difference in how I've been able to pursue subsequent educational opportunities as well. So public policy supporting college, uh, around the issue of college, has really focused on access. Helping students get into college. Uh, making sure that those who have not had the opportunity to go to college have the opportunity to go to college. And lately, we have seen a little bit of a shift in the conversation. We still kind of talk about access, but there's been more and more <coughs> conversation on completion. People want to talk about getting out of college, and they, that is ultimately the goal that we all want to see. We want to see people who go to college get into college, but we shouldn't abandon the uh, access argument in, in favor of a completion argument. I actually see it as an and. We have to focus on access and completion. We can't negate one in favor of the other. So with that said, I think when we talk about completion, we have to recognize that the first step to completing college depends on accessing college. And the question of access is access to where, access how, and access to what. Access where all depends on where you go. Access how is dealing with how you pay for it, the cost, and all of those different things, how it's financed. And access to what gets into issues of quality and educational performance and that type of thing. The first two of those pieces we're going to touch on a little part during this discussion. Access where and access how. And the reason I think this is so important because it has been proven that where you ultimately enter the system or how you enter the system determines as or as a predictor of whether or not you will exit the system. So we really have to be sure that when we provide students access to college, that we're putting them on a path that will ultimately lead them to success. So let's begin by just looking at some enrollment trends. And you see some data up on that slide. In recent days, we have about 18 million students enrolled in our higher education system. 18 million. 
And those 18 million students are spread out over a very diverse array of institutions, two-year institutions, four-year institutions, for-profit institutions, and they are approximately about 3,000 different institutions of higher education out there, give or take. And as you will see, in 2008, black African-American students represented 12.5% of that 18 million. Hispanic students represented slightly less, and white students about two-thirds of the population is white. So the minority student composition in our higher education institutions collectively is about 30%, 33%, and African-American students represent 12.5 of that percentage. So you may wonder, like, how does this uh, play out against what we've seen over the past few years? Well, when you look at college access, college enrollment trends over the past 30 years, you will see that there has been some changes. So for all racial and ethnic groups, there has been an increase and the number of students who have enrolled in college increases across the board every single racial groups. What has not increased is the proportion and the gaps. In fact, we've seen some trends actually get a little bit worse. For African Americans and white students, the gap in college enrollment is exactly the same that it's been for about 30 years. It fluctuates up and down, but for the most part, you'll see that there's no significant change there. For Hispanic students, it's actually worse. And when you look at low-income students and you look at high-income students, you see that that trend has gotten a whole lot worse over time. So it makes us wonder, we've been doing some things, but obviously we have not seen the types of outcomes that, that we would desire just yet. So another thing that we've noticed that's not on this chart is that there have been some enrollment shifts as to where students are going. For the most part, students tend to still enroll in four-year institutions, public and private, but most, uh, many African-American students are now enrolling in greater proportions in for-profit institutions and in community colleges. So that's important to know. And another thing that's important to take notice of is many of them are not going anywhere at all. That's a trend that we need to be very aware of, even when we look at this data and we look at where students are and the proportions. There's some students that are not even captured in this data because they're not even in the system. And many of these students are what we call college qualified students. And I want to bring this up because I think it's really important to always note that we're talking about many students who are prepared academically, who are ready to enroll in college. And I've been in many conversations, and sometimes when we start talking about various populations of students, when we talk about minority students, we talk about low-income students, there's this implicit and immediate decision or assumption that these students aren't academically prepared. They're not ready for college. Now, that's true for some. Some of our kids are in schools that are not serving them well, that are not preparing them to go on to college, and we need to take note of that, and we need to fix that problem. But there are others who are ready to go to college. And for that group of college qualified students, they're not going to college at the rates of which we think they should be going. Many of them are not going at all. And there's been a lot of data published on this through the Advisory Committee on Student Financial Assistance. And one of our reports that I mentioned, Promise Loss, actually looks at college qualified students who don't enroll anywhere. So keep that in mind. So, now that we know that some of these students aren't enrolling in college, the question is why aren't they enrolling in college? Or why are they choosing institutions that they haven't chosen before? Why are students who would have gone to a four-year institution all of a sudden going to a two-year institution? Any assumptions? Any thoughts? I see you read money. Money. That's really, that's, that's the reason why. Money. Uh, we did a survey of some guidance counselors of these college qualified students who didn't go to college to ask them what were their impressions as to the reason why their students didn't go. 70% of the guidance counselors said that it had something to do with college costs and of being able to afford and pay for college. 70% of guidance counselors said that. When we asked the students, 80% of the students said that it was because of money or the availability of financial aid. So this is what our students are telling us. So for those students who do enroll, those African Americans who do enroll, many of them take out loans. And Ken is going to probe this in much more detail. 
But what I want you to see here is the different sectors that are represented. We have the public four-year sector, the private non-for-profit uh, four-year sector, public two-year, and for-profit. And African Americans are the color in red, which may or may not be hard to see from where you're sitting. But even if it's hard to tell which color, it's the one that's highest in all categories. <laughs> It's the one that's highest in all categories. So we did this study on aversion to borrowing and trying to see who, what, what racial groups are most debt averse. And we found that it was not African American students. They are taking out loans in high rates and regardless of institutional sector, and you'll see certain institutions, they take out higher amounts of loans and that's a trend of, and a function of college costs. So for-profit sector, they're taking out much more in terms of student loans than they are in the public two-year or even in the public four-year sector. So when you think about all of this, and you think about those students who do go to college, they do finish, they have these loans, what does that mean for them when they graduate? How do they then make decisions about their life and their, their future? And how does this loan that they have to pay back influence that? So we wanted to just give you some ideas in terms of graduate school enrollment and how student debt has played into that. So Dara talked a little bit about graduate school and her, her experiences and that decision you have to make about making a living, paying back this loan, are going to make a further investment in your education. And that's, for many students, quite a struggle and a challenge to negotiate all of that. And right now we see that out of the students who are in graduate school, African Americans make up about 12% of that population. And most of those students are enrolled in education programs, which oftentimes mean that they're going part-time and working full-time somewhere else to pursue that degree. And the second most popular major in graduate school among African Americans is to pursue a business degree to get a master's in business administration. So these statistics that I've kind of talked a little bit about, for me and I think for many of you, they don't necessarily provide you with any new information. They kind of probably confirm what you have already known or already suspected, and now you have the data to back it up. Uh, so we know the students who are in need. We know that African American students continue to face tremendous challenges getting to and getting through college. We know that. We also know that these challenges are faced by even those students who are college qualified, those students who are academically prepared. And what we also know is that African American students who are also low income students, they have the worst situation of them all. They are really facing a significant shortfall in terms of being able to go to college, being able to pay for college. What we also know is where these students are. We know where to find them. We know that there are solid numbers of these students who are at four-year institutions, but that the growing trend is that they're going to community colleges and they're going to for-profit institutions. So now that we know, we know who they are, we know where they are, and we have the data con to confirm our suspicions. So the next step is that we need to really think through and determine some legitimate strategies so that the trends that we faced for the last 30 years, which has not really advanced us much at all, we can make sure that we don't repeat that in the upcoming uh, next 20, 30 years over time. To repeat what we have done and what we have seen would be completely unacceptable, to be perfectly honest, completely unacceptable. So what my challenge is for all of us today, myself included, the panelists, we're all in a position where we can influence and affect change. We all are, you all are, by virtue of you being at this meeting, it says to me that you can do something. So what we, I want to come out of this is that we can start holding ourselves, first of all, accountable. But we also need to hold the institutions that we graduated from, the institutions that we represent, the ones that our kids go to school at. We need to hold them accountable. We need to be armed with data, and we need to really force them to do right by these kids. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Ken, and he can give you all the interesting facts about student loan debt. <laughs> Maybe he'll impress us all.
Uh, good afternoon. I would like to uh, also echo uh, what Michelle said about being very delighted to be here. Uh, my name is Ken Red. As uh, Brian said, I am uh, I just finished my first year as the director of research and policy analysis for NACUBO, the National Association of College and University Business Officers. And for those of you who aren't quite sure what that means, that means we're the people in college campuses who handle the money. We're the chief financial officers, the chief business officers, the the, uh, the, the folks who, who, who try to get the bills paid for institutions. And do I, do I don't worry about And but in my prior life, before coming to Nakubo, excuse me, while I oops, I take this down, there it is. Before coming to Nakubo, I spent a number of years working with people like Ryan and Don on on issues involving financial aid. And so that's what I want to talk about. Um, uh, Ryan asked us to talk a little bit about our own background, so I'll, I'll do that first. Um, I've actually uh, been in Washington for almost 20 years now. Um, I started my career out of, right after grad school, uh, working for the Library of Congress in their Education and Public Welfare Division. That was my first entry into doing it, uh, studies on student financial aid, and, and since then I've I've been in various uh, other organizations. I've worked for Sally Mae, the student loan lender, for a while, where I, where I met uh, Don originally, and, and uh, Ryan and I worked together at, at NASFA doing work in uh, uh, college financial aid, and, and, uh, and now I find myself at Nakubo. And at Nakubo, uh, we do a very interesting study, which I'm involved with uh, looking at uh, college endowments. And as you all probably know, uh, the last year or so of in investing have been really bad. Uh, if, if, you, if, if you want to get an idea, um, uh, you know, if you looked at your 401k or retirement statements over the last uh, year, uh, if you're like me, you're, you're, you're not sure you're going to retire anytime soon. So, uh, you know, you've been down 25 to 30%, you know. You know um, but um, for colleges, it's been really, uh, uh, devastating in a lot of ways because at the same time that their endowments have been down 20 percent, 25 percent, they've also seen state appropriations cuts and, and cuts in other funding. For students, that means some of the programs that uh, all of us would like to support um, uh, have really been hurt. Uh, a lot of colleges fund either institutional grant programs with their endowment uh, revenue. And since that revenue has been cut, um, in a lot of cases, that, that funding for students has also been threatened. But there are also, you know, uh, Michelle sort of alluded to a lot of college access programs and, and, and you know, TRIO and those kinds of programs which, which uh, uh, both the federal government and some institutions fund as well. And those programs, because of what we've seen, are going to be even more leaned upon to try to correct some of the gaps that Michelle talked about. Um, but uh, what I really wanted to talk about is uh, something that Michelle sort of alluded to, and that's the whole issue of debt and borrowing. Um, because uh, for one, obviously, I think a lot of us are aware of is that it's, even with increases in Pell Grants and, and, and other sources of financial aid, it has become the, the primary means in a lot of cases for students to fund their educational programs. And I think that will happen even more so going forward because, as I mentioned before, the, the declines in endowments and, and cuts in other types of support programs, support services for students, you're going to see, I think, more students relying more on, uh, on debt and borrowing. For African Americans, uh, roughly two-thirds at public institutions borrowed, and at private four-year institutions, roughly three-quarters received at least one student loan, and you can see the average amount. See, for African Americans, just for one year of study, uh, $6,200 of, of loans on average, uh, and then at, at uh, four-year public institutions, about $5,700 just for one year of study uh, to, to attend college. And um, we'll, I, I'm sure in the question and answer period, we'll get into some reasons why this happens, but I mentioned one of them. I think part of the problem for African Americans is especially since most of our students are first generation, 
they don't know about scholarship searches and other sources of, of financial aid other than what they might get from the federal government or what they might get from maybe some states or in some cases some institutions. Uh, so I think that's part of it, is that just the lack of knowledge about what are the other alternatives to, to borrowing. Uh, but the other thing that this points out, and, and, and Don will talk about this more, is the need for loan counseling and for, and for to, to you know, because uh, um, what Michelle said is, is, is very right, that you know, the, the worry that a lot of students have when they take out loans is what's, what's this going to, how's it going to impact my life after I leave school? And, you know, if you're at an institution, you're borrowing $5,700 to $6,200 uh, just for one year of school, you know, that obviously, as you know, that sort of adds up. Um, and the next chart I want to show is just how that adds up. And this, what this is looking at is the cumulative debt. Um, what happens after four or five years of school? And this is just this chart is just looking at the, the students who got degrees. So they, these are students who graduated with a BA or BS degree um, in 2008. And as you can see, you know, nearly 80 percent, nearly eight out of ten, at both public and private institutions among African Americans. And again, greater, higher than any other group. And you know, this points out, you know, you know what you see in the first, in, in the prior years, the one year borrowing sort of carries forward to the, the four or five years. And um, and you can see how that compares to the other racial ethnic groups. Again, pointing out that that, that the, the the need for um, more information among uh, African Americans about uh, uh, other sources of financial aid besides uh, borrowing and and, and debt. And uh, Don, uh, I'm sorry, not Don. Michelle, when she ta was talking, she mentioned sort of the, the whole issue of of going on to graduate school. And and, and what Michelle said is, is very true. Um, about a quarter of all African Americans who receive a, a bachelor's degree enter graduate school within a, a year or two of receiving their degrees, which is good, actually. Actually, uh, um, compared to other racial ethnic groups, African Americans. Um, uh, Tend to enroll in graduate schools at a slightly higher rate than other groups, which is a, which is good. Um, the problem is with entering um, education and and business as the two predominant degree fields for African Americans. Uh, the funding for those students is very limited. Um, uh, 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 you know, I, I don't know how many people here are, are getting their their. PhDs or graduate degrees in, in education, as, as Ryan is, but Ryan, above anybody else in the room, could probably tell you how difficult it is in that field to fund your education. Um, most of the funding for graduate studies um, uh, is in the sciences, math, sciences, engineering. Um, um, if you know, if, if if I had to, if I could advise anybody who was going to grad school, if they had the skills and they had the interest, which fields did you go into? Um, it would definitely be in, in something in the sciences, because that's where the that's where the funding is. That's you're less much less likely to graduate with with debt from those fields. And as you can see, unfortunately, for, among African Americans, um, because of the uh, the overemphasis on on education, particularly this. The great many percentage in masters and and slightly less, uh, but still predominant in doctoral uh, programs who are getting loans and and the amounts that you see here, uh, those are just for one year, one year of, of schooling for graduate studies. So you know well over 50, well over sixteen thousand for a master's program and well over twenty thousand for one year of doctoral study. Um, so that that is pretty frightening, I think. Um, the assumption, I think, is that students, if they borrow, you know, they, 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 it's an investment in yourself. You know, you'll be able to pay the money back, especially with a master's or a doctoral degree, you'll be able to pay the money back and, and live a good life. Um, and I think, you know, you know, you know uh, from my generations and generations before mine, uh, that was generally true. You know, I, I borrowed to go to graduate school. I didn't borrow this much, but I borrowed. And, 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 you know, I paid it back, and I, I lived a good life, and everything like that. But, you know, we're in a recession now, and, and I think there's a lot more concern that the jobs that I had and my colleagues have that, you know, that helped, have helped us live a comfortable life may not be there for the next generation of, of African-American leaders who are going on to school. So, um, just some summary, summary thoughts, and like I said, Ryan uh, and the rest of the panelists and hopefully you all too will, will ask some probing questions about this. I just want to leave you with the thought that 
that I think um, going forward, you know, uh, Michelle wishes us a challenge. My challenge for myself and my colleagues and all of you here is is to try to help students who are sort of coming up in the that next generation. You know, show them these type of numbers. Give them at least give them the information. Tell them, you know, it, it, it's okay. It, you know, if you want to borrow, you know, this is America. You know, if you want to borrow, you go ahead. You can, you know, you can. But know the danger that may be involved. First of all, and then secondly, you know, you know, there are lots of scholarship programs out there. There are lots of lots of of, of degree fields and that give much more generous financial aid than the ones we've traditionally entered. At least explore those, try to find some other avenues to fund your education before you go into the, 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 the debt arena. And with that, I'll turn it over to, to Zakia. Thank you. Somebody will let you in. We got money for you to go. 
Um, and so <laughs> I was thinking about the former president we had that had some of those <laughs> same issues. I won't go there today. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, well, I thought about that with my classmates in, in high school and even in college. You know, why, why do some people drop out? Why did they leave? Why didn't they go on to college? Or why didn't they start that business that they were talking about, that fashion design or whatever? You know, they wanted to open up their own barbershop and they just never were able to get that support or whatever they need. Because now when we think about college, it's not necessarily just the four-year college, but maybe a two-year college, maybe you want to learn a trade or get some more training in different um, a different skill and, and providing support for people to do that is also very important. And the president, I guess, to get into what we're doing, he has a goal that is very ambitious, um, and that is to have every American have at least one year of college or post uh, post secondary training. So whether that's an apprenticeship program, whether you're a plumber and you want to learn how to be a better plumber and you need a certification to do so, so that you can open up your own business, whether that is going to get your associate's degree and you want to be a nurse whether that's going to go ahead and be a teacher or whether you're going to go ahead and uh, you know, be a chemist or you know, something like that. Whatever you want to do, we want every American, and we need every American, in fact, because we're in such a dire situation with our economy. We don't have, you know, we don't have the luxury to have people just you know, who, who aren't skilled. We, we're not in that economy right now. So actually, uh, the Department of Education has really been thinking more and more about how do we fit into the, the workforce and how do we fit into the labor force. And how, do, how, how are the things that we're doing encouraging people to go into the careers to build our economy back up um, in, the next, um, in the next few years and over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years over time. And so I guess what we're doing, the base of our, our, um, our higher education financing system on the federal level anyway, has been based on the Pell Grant. Pell Grant is for, for low income families. And um, I will say that uh, when you look across racial and ethnic groups, African American students benefit from the Pell Grant at a higher a disproportionate level than other income groups because we're poor. Mm -hmm. And so um, we're trying to increase the Pell Grant because what happens every year, the Pell Grant has been at about, mm, I'll say that about two or three years ago, the Pell Grant was about $4,700. So if you went to a private college like many of us did, that seems like nothing. However, if you're going to a community college or you're going to a public four-year and, and you're in-state in many places, that can cover a significant part of tuition at least. Um, and so, but, but what happens is tuition goes up every year faster than the rate of inflation. So you freshman, you got a $4,700 Pell, $4, Pell Grant, great. Tuition was $6,000. You had to come up with uh, $1,300. Okay, next year tuition is $6,500, but your Pell Grant is still $4,700. Okay, so junior year, your tuition is now $7,000, but your Pell Grant is still $4,700. Um, and so that's a problem, and that's a problem that we, um, we, we're trying to work on by, we've got legislation in Congress right now to increase the, well, first of all, before the legislation we got, through the Stimulus Act, we uh, had a very convincing argument that we need not just a stimulus in business, but that, that the education sector is connected to our labor market and is connected to reinvesting in America. So we asked for an increase of the Pell Grant within the Stimulus Act of, um, of I think it was $500. And so the stimulus provides this Pell Grant increase. Well, that stimulus is a two-year stimulus program. So what we need now is to sustain that Pell Grant increase and to combat this problem of rising college tuition every year, we need to index it to the rate of inflation plus 1% because colleges are increasing their tuition at a higher rate than inflation. So we're increasing, we're asking Congress, and they're, hopefully they're going to come along with us, to increase the Pell Grant by inflation plus 1% for the next 10 years um, so that students, low-income students, can really have something firm, a grant program, to help them get through college. Now we know that is not enough because I just said that 4,700. I think we're asking them to increase it to 5,500. Okay, and it will go up to almost $7,000 by the time this is over. Which, if you know, if you're in policy and you're kind of a wonk, you know that Pell Grant. We were so happy when they didn't cut the Pell Grant. You know, we're so happy when they get five dollars more. So to ask for, you know, to get this much more is a big deal. But when you're on a campus and you're a student. $7,000 still don't seem like a whole lot when you got a tuition that might be ten or fifteen thousand dollars, or even more if you're going to a private, uh, you know, four-year institution. So, in addition to that, there's something, and I'll give credit where credit is due. Uh, two years ago, Congress, or two, three years ago now, Congress signed, uh, Congress passed legislation um, that would create an income-based repayment plan. President Bush signed that legislation. So, all right. Um, so that means that for your student loans. 
Um, and this is kind of, I guess, the crux of what, what is probably most relevant to people here today that are struggling with student loan debt. For student loans, instead of paying based on how much um, loan debt you have, so if you have forty, you know, fifty thousand dollars in loan debt, usually we calculate a, a payment plan of ten. The standard repayment plan is ten years based on that loan amount, and you have to pay, you know, whatever based on that um, amount that you have. This repayment plan allows you to pay based on how much money you make. So instead of paying, you know, um, I have some examples here. If you had $25,000 worth of debt, which is, I think that's a little higher than the average amount of debt that people have now. I think you, depending on what college you go to, you're going to have more. Um, but your loan payment would usually be $288 a month. And that's, you know, whatever. You have more, you go to graduate school, that's just a typical coming out of undergrad, you know, loan debt. Um, so it would be obviously more if you had $100,000 in loan debt. Under the income-based repayment plan, and I want to stress this, no matter how much your debt is, um, if you made $20,000 a year, for instance, you'd be paying $47 a month. So even if you had that same $25,000 in loan debt, which would usually be $288 a month, if you're in a low-income job before you want to go into public service or whatever, your loan, your payment is based on how much you make. So we have a calculator online, and I had a, went, I was at the office today, and I printed out all of my, my copies, and I wanted to give them out, and I left them on the desk. But I will say, that um, it's a it's you know ed.gov is our website. If you want to be more specific and get you closer to this actual calculator, it's studentaid.ed.gov, and you can put in um, your income, your loan debt, and it'll tell you how much you would be paying under the income-based repayment plan. And you can check and see, you know, is this something that would be advantageous for me? For, for some people, it's not advantageous because honestly, if you're making sixty thousand dollars and you have twenty-five thousand dollars loan debt, we're probably going to tell you you could pay that two hundred eighty-eight dollars a month. Now, you may feel differently, but that's what we're going to tell you. Um, and, in, and it's based on your income. So as your income goes up, obviously the amount that you would pay goes up. For instance, if you're making $30,000, it's $172 a month. Still less than the $288 a month that you'd be asked to pay. But still, um, if somebody that's, especially when you're coming out entry level in a rough economy such as this, um, this is really something that just hopefully can provide some assurance that it's going to be okay. And remind you, I just gave you a $25,000 loan limit, uh, a loan amount example, but this is the same amount that you would pay regardless if you had $100,000, regardless if you had 100, you know, up to the maximum. So it's based on the amount that you're, that you make and not the amount that you actually owe. And so that was implemented July 1st, this past summer. Um, and so if you have student loans and you think that you're in a, um, a profession or you're making um, less than you would, might be able to afford uh, paying off, I urge you to go on, do the calculator, and see if that's something you'd like to sign up for in order to pay your loans back. Um, in thinking about your life in, you know, in the long term, it does add in terms of the, the length of time that you will be paying. So you need to kind of weigh the cost-benefit analysis of, do I want to pay out my loans over a longer period of time, or do I really need the cash right now? You can always change and go into another repayment option, and you'll never be paying more per month than you would have been paying under the standard repayment plan. So there are some protections built in there, but it's kind of a safety net for when you graduate to know that you're able to, to do that. And the kind of best part of it is after you graduate, after you paid on this loan for 25 years, if you paid on it for 25 years, if you still have a loan balance, we just say forget it. It's, it's forgiven. And um, that amount that was forgiven used to be um, taxable, or it is taxable currently at the moment. It's not a problem until 25 years from now when the first person uh, becomes eligible for forgiveness, however, or actually 10 years from now, which is what I'll get to in a second. Um, but the uh, Secretary of Education is really feels strongly that that shouldn't be something that we tax, that that shouldn't be something that we're asking people to burden with if we're going to forgive it. It should really be forgiven. And so he's actually supporting a bill going through Congress right now that would um, exempt those from taxes as well. So there's no kind of negative consequence for that. So like I said, I'm really excited to work in an administration where people have the right things in, in mind and the right things at heart. And the second part of that, you know, so after 25 years you're paying on it, it's just forgiven. If you work in public service, um, which is a, a nonprofit or government, um, it's pretty broadly defined, you're, and you're paying on that income-based repayment plan and you're paying, you know, um, you have a lower income, after 10 years your loan is forgiven. So, um, and as any 501c3, uh, nonprofit qualifies. So if you're working for 10 years in public service, um, you know, government, you know, teaching, um, nursing, those types of public service fields, 
after 10 years of paying on your loan, um, your loan will be forgiven rather than the 25 years that we would uh, require, you know, forgive for everyone else. So those are two things that I hope um, provide some sort of uh, a feeling of a little bit of relief, even though it doesn't take away your loans. For, you know, we get a lot of requests. Can you just forgive all my loans? I'm like, well, you know, that's a huge ask. But you know, we think this is a huge step in the right direction. Um, I will just touch on a couple of other things that are, are related, and then I'll, I'll sit down. Um, we had a, a middle class task force in Syracuse, I think a month ago, and Joe Biden leads this, um, Vice President Joe Biden leads this middle class task force where he goes to different cities and talks to people about different issues related to the middle class. And he, in this particular stop, he was with the Secretary of Education, and a, a young man stood up and he said, you know, you're saying a lot, it was about college affordability, college affordability and for, you know, in general. And he said, you know, you're talking about a lot of things that you guys are doing to help us pay down debt that we've accrued from institutions. Now, what are you guys doing to make sure the institutions don't keep on charging more money? <laughs> because you're getting at one part of the problem. It was like, man, that's a good question coming from a sophomore in college. You know, must be doing something right at Syracuse, getting people to think about things. And, and um, honestly, the federal government has a lot less uh, direct, we don't have any direct control over institutions. I have some people that would be mad if I said we had any like direct control over how much tuition they could charge. However, we do have some levers that we can pull, some money that we give to institutions um, for different financial aids for them to give out to their students. And we can base that money on things like, are you providing your students with enough need-based aid? Now, we're not telling you how much tuition you have to charge, but what are you doing to help students, um, you know, what are you doing to be cost-effective within your field, within similar institutions, within other institutions? If you're a two-year institution, are you, are you, do you have low cost relative to that? If you're a private four-year, do you have low cost relative to those types of institutions? And, and for students that come with need, and you know, honestly, we care less about students that come whose families are billionaires and they want to pay, they want to have a boutique college. I went to Vanderbilt and they opened up a nail, a nail salon and a, um, what did we have? We had a dry cleaner that would drop the clothes off at your, um, at your door. Now, if you know, you want to go and pay for all of that and you got families that you want to give those services to, we don't really get into that. But for the low income students who are coming to your school, please make it affordable for them. And we're going to, we, our idea also in this um, legislation that's moving through Congress is to ask, um, to, to base some of our loan money that we give to colleges on whether or not they're doing a good job keeping the cost down for the students who need, um, who need financial aid. And so that's what we're doing on the kind of cost, cost control um, and making sure that they don't let their tuition um, go through the, the roof uh, for, for the, the students who need, uh, to need to go to college the most. Um, and then finally, um, We've got something called um, the College Access and Completion Fund. Um, we're not sure how this is going to look yet, but it's basically the idea being that we need programs to help students get through college. And what we really need is more so that programs we need, really, we need colleges and university systems to think differently about graduation. Because we have a graduation crisis. We have a, um, we have, we have a problem in that we, we are not, no longer first in the world with our uh, college graduation rates, but we're also no longer first in the world with our, the proportion of our adult population that holds degrees and, and, and certificates. So like I said, the president and the, we've got people like the Council of Economic Advisors who are concerned about this, not from a do good, everybody should go to college perspective, but because that means that our global competitiveness, our ability to compete with China and India is threatened because we don't have a skilled workforce. And so I kind of mentioned that, um, that before, but the Access and Completion Fund is kind of on the thinking that we need to get at systems change. We need university systems to reach out to people who have not, say you've completed, you know, I don't know how, you, you had a program that was 100 credits and you completed 90 of them. We would like them to contact you to figure out why you didn't finish the last 10 and would you like to come back um, and tell you about financial aid opportunities. We need, and I, I, you know, we're not telling them exactly what to do, but what we're telling them is here's a financial incentive to do something. And so um, we're working with Congress to see how that is formulated and, and see what we're going to allow to be funded. But um, that is the idea behind that, and that's a $2.5 billion investment. Um, the, the Pell Grant increases cost a lot of money, which is honestly why they haven't done it before. It's a $40 billion investment as well. And that's B, you know, billion. I know it sounds like after the stimulus and everything, 700 billion, billion, just like, oh, it's a billion here, a billion there. But that's still a lot of money. <laughs> that's still a lot of money. So if anybody just wants to drop a million on me, I can, uh, you know, I can't come out of government to do that. That's, we have some new laws against things like that. But, uh, <laughs>
depending on what the, the position is. So I'll leave. Um, anyway, so those are some of the things that we're doing. I'm very happy to answer uh, questions afterwards about things that I might not have touched on um, or things within the possibly the K-12 kind of side of things that, that we didn't get to touch on. And I'm going to hand it over to Donna to talk about some concrete ways that you can uh, look at it. I consider myself to be a lifelong learner. My name is Dawn McCoy, and these are colleagues who I have the highest regard for. Thank you for Jeanette and Ryan for putting this together. Uh, because this is a crisis that we're in. We are in very troubled times. And without an education, you can do nothing. I want to implore each of you, if you have not already embarked on a journey in post-secondary education, to do so now. Whether or not it's a technical training program that we've heard about, a graduate program, an undergraduate degree, a certification, whatever it might be, please. Uh, this is going to be one of the most important sessions that you attend here, I have to say. Not because higher education is near and dear to my heart, but we know going back 150 years that the rationale is that you can do nothing without an education. And being of African American descent, it's going to be crucial that you have that background. So to that, um, yes, we'll be uh, taking some questions. No, I just yes. wanted to say I'm with a federal, you forgot about the Fed, the Fed. I forgot about federal the funding agency giving free money to go to school. Okay. So, so are you with the Department of Education? Environmental <laughs> Protection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So certainly we do want to keep in mind um, the uh, NGOs, uh, obviously the federal agencies, as well as any foundations. I know that there were some foundations in the session uh, prior to this one. So just a moment and I'll see. Uh, Is that Walmart person here for the scholarships? <laughs> nope. It was sent over. But nonetheless. Okay. So I will go through just quickly um, and what I want to do because with the uh, information that I want to share with you today, I want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity. How, how many folks have pen and paper? It's going to be like school in here, right? Okay, so I don't have my slides either but I do want to make sure that you get the information here today. Um, I got my start in several different ways. I have bounced between policy and politics over the last 20 years. And I want to make sure that what you hear from me today is what I imparted uh, partly in my experience as a financial aid representative at Georgetown Law Financial Aid Office, but also through the years working with these fine folks in various national organizations as an elected school board member and in my current capacity um, at Educational Credit Management Corporation, a student loan organization uh, based in Minnesota, but with regional offices in Richmond, Virginia, Eugene, Oregon, and Santa Fe, New Mexico. At various points in history, there have been chapters of purported and real wealth for African Americans. This has been documented through post-reconstruction in the 1890s and after initial implementation in the civil rights era and the measures of the 1960s. In recent years, African Americans have continued to make some gains, but they still trail behind other majority ethnic groups overall with regard to wealth. Statistics have shown that over the last 20 years, a growing number of African Americans in the middle class have emerged. For instance, we see in nearby Prince George's County very affluent African Americans. But now that we have a little bit of pocket change, you know, we have a diploma in one hand, we have Benjamins in the other, right? And we think, well, I got a nice car, I've got a nice house, I can buy motorcycles, bikes, boats, and fine clothes, right? But what I really want us to consider is how are we really taking a look at funding our opportunities for our educational experience? How are we thinking about investing in our future for tomorrow, for our children's children, just like our parents did for us? Are we being proactive to repay our student loans, to manage our debt? to consciously save our money and to monitor our credit histories? Are we looking at going to a traditional four-year institution, a two-year community college, a for-profit, a beauty school, truck driving school, plumbing apprenticeships and certification? What are we doing to sustain the wealth that we have achieved resulting from getting our post-secondary education? And more importantly, how are we being really financially responsible? A fundamental question for us is this. What can we do, all of us here today, and all those at the conference, but what can college students and graduates do to maintain their financial stability and also be stewards of resources that we have? So my brief remarks today will just underscore for you this. 
financial literacy, and debt management. Quite simply that, nothing complicated, but really some very basic principles about how we can make sure we are maintaining the wealth that has been generated in our communities and in our families. I am a second generation college student and college graduate. I'm proud to say that my parents were the first in their families to go to college, and they saw fit, even though not one of them went to an HBCU, they made sure that I attended Howard University. Uh, I was raised in California. Ain't Jews in the house? Go Bison. They made sure that we, my brother, sister, and I had access to an opportunity to go to school. And so knowing that I wanted to go to Howard University, being from California, they said, great, get on over there, figure out how you're going to pay for it. What? Wait a minute, right? I thought you guys were taking care of me. Well, they did. They helped me get to that point of 18 and then said, guess what? We want to make sure you get on where you need to go. And we'll give you some encouragement, a little spending change, pay for your housing. On that, you're on your own. And so therefore, I had to get very creative in talking with the financial aid office on a consistent basis. I knew them all very well. I made sure that I was not only a college work study student in the library, but I explored all the scholarships that were listed, not on the website at the time, this is 20 years ago, prior to website, but in the manual that was provided. So making sure that I was talking with people on campus. So the first step I say to you in your success with higher education funding is being creative and thoughtful about how to finance your education. It's more than just being literate about, oh, I have uh, more than my minimum balance. Oh, I know how to count money. No, it's way more than that. It's about making sure that you know how to handle your appropriate finances from day to day, that you seek assistance from the financial aid office readily and actively. Organizations like CAT and the Kubo, that you're talking with the people in the business office when it comes time to that check or the things that are on your account, you're talking to financial aid and the business office, make yourself known. The second point, more importantly, is to manage your school-related debt. How many times have I seen folks get out of school only to say, oh, you know, I'm going to take care of that later, right? They ignore the envelopes that come in the mail. They ignore the phone calls that come. They don't respond. What I'll talk about in a moment is some of the strategies that you all can do, making sure you as leaders and you as people who are going to sustain the wealth of our communities, that you are managing that school-related debt. Repaying the student loans in a timely fashion with creative resource that Zakia talked about from the Department of Education. Beyond standard repayment in 10 years, income-based repayment 25 years, but being mindful about different financial circumstances. And it's particularly important now that we are in these challenging economic times. How can we have any excuse with the information and the resources that are out there for us that if we don't ask? So one, how to be stewards of our money, and two, how to manage our debt. How do I know that these factors are essential? Well, as I mentioned, I went to Howard University as an undergraduate student, then went across town to Georgetown Public Policy Institute. Another rude awakening when I saw the bill for how much it was to attend. Just a cool $25,000, right? Chump change, right? No. So I decided I was going to work my way through school. Worked and went to school at night. Thank goodness I researched a part-time scholarship that was available that paid for half of my education. Have to be creative. And I said to myself, well, I want to make sure I go to the finest school that can support my interest in public policy. While there, I worked on Capitol Hill and made sure to get as much experience as I could, also trying to make sure I was learning as much about higher education policy. <clears throat> Later, in my capacities in various leadership roles, as an executive in higher education, working for Nakubo, in fact, prior to Ken's arrival, working for the College Board, the makers of the SAT, and working for lenders. My current role, Educational Credit Management Corporation, is a student lender guarantor. We are the ones who will collect on a student loan should a student not pay for that loan. We are also the organization, one of 36 in the nation, that helps to provide financial literacy information. And so I know the importance of providing preventative measures for students. And I tell you, it's not pretty when a student does not repay the student loan. We want to make sure that there's enough information out there to be able to be helpful. 
But one of the greatest honors I had was being an elected school board member. Uh, at the age of 32, I was elected to the Sacramento City School Board. I was very involved in the community there and in the state of California to really make sure that I was doing all I could to help build college financial aid awareness. I was dismayed to learn that inner city students did not have access to the same financial aid information that was available to students in the suburbs. Disheartening, nonetheless, I took to the streets and started a campaign, really to help students with their financial literacy, college awareness programs, adult learner trade and technical programs, and also more importantly, financial literacy efforts. We had an annual college financial aid day. Most of the colleges around California, we hosted 20 programs throughout the state annually. There was a measure in the state legislature passed for college awareness in the month of February. And so my job mounting a statewide campaign for public awareness for young people. People took note and suddenly there I was in the political arena. School board seat opened up and I ran for the school board the first time out the blocks. Mostly it was grassroots, but it was mostly because people saw the passion I had for making sure that high school students grade school students, adult learners, all had access to information, those who were being denied. And when I got on the school board, I didn't let up. So when there were college fairs, when there were college prep programs, when they tried to deny a truck driving training school in the school district, I fought for that. Because it was important not only that we took to post-secondary education, meaning college and traditional college, but it meant also those non-traditional programs, for-profit institution programs. In 2006, I made a conscious decision not to run again for the school board. Again, my life has gone back and forth between politics and policy. I felt I could have more of an impact on the outside, working with people, making sure to support and reinforce financial literacy programs. Um, while I was at EdFund, the California guarantor, I started a program called I'm Going to College. It was a one-day program to help fourth grade students spend the day at college. So we would go to Cal, UCLA, UC San Diego, all the different programs so fourth grade students could have a one-day experience about what it was like to go to college. The funny thing was we actually had pretend financial aid money for the young people. And I remember the joy on their face when they received the monopoly money saying, here's my financial aid check. And they'd be saying, wow, I wish I had some of that monopoly money <laughs> back in the day. But it's important that I think that we really take note about the importance of, obviously there are programs out there for those among you who are parents, for those among us who are students repaying student loans, and those among us who are thinking about those who are coming behind, how we can help each one to make sure that we know. Part of my work now is with HBCUs, Historical Black Colleges and Universities. In the state of Virginia, there are six and I work with them on a regular basis to make sure that we are providing not only college access programs, but college persistence programs. And I was so glad to hear Michelle talk about that and the importance of the retention and not only the front end of college access, but keeping people in. I think one of the most significant reasons we've heard, people will drop out because of lack of finances or a personal circumstance. And how do we really make sure that again, we're staying ahead of the game with the access question and making sure that we are helping one another. Someone once said that yesterday is a canceled check, tomorrow is a promissory note, and today is only cash. So spend it wisely. I say to all of you this because what I'd like to do is have pen and paper is just outline for you briefly a couple of really high level strategic points about maintaining very focused financial aid perspective with regard to financial literacy. First, I would say, as Sakia underscored, the importance of repayment. Typically, a student will get out of school and they will have a six-month grace period until their loans kick in, in which someone will write them a letter or they'll get a phone call saying your loans are now due. So what I say to all of you who are possibly in that circumstance approaching graduation or if you're even in that time window, to be in contact either with your financial aid office or more importantly, your lender. Uh, to be proactive. Um, if you're looking for a job, to make sure that you're letting that lender know, I might not be employed right now. There are options called deferments and forbearance. Anyone know what those are here? I see some nodding of heads. I've taken out several myself, so 
different times in my life where I've needed to have a stop in payment for a student loan. And so you're being proactive and saying, before you get the phone call, I had Sally Mae, interestingly enough, programmed into my cell phone. Not only for myself, but for family members who would say, oh my gosh, you're in financial aid, can you help me? Uh, my brother and sister-in-law, I'm proud to say, parents of four are both going back to school now uh, through efforts over the last 10 years to say they want to raise a family, but they want to finish college. And so me being able to be helpful and saying, okay, now you guys program Sally Mae into the phone, okay? So that everyone can be very thoughtful about making sure to repay. With regard to debt and with regard to budget, I want to say, understand your debt and manage it, number one. Know what you owe. I live like a student today, so you don't have to live like one tomorrow, please. All of us went to fine private institutions, and Ryan is in school finishing his doctorate and doing fine work, but if the funding is not there, don't go out and live lavish. You know, I know everybody wants to party it up this weekend, right? <laughs> please don't break the piggy bank. So make sure that you are being very mindful about your budget. Um, with regard to budget as well, pay more than your minimum amount that's due. Don't just pay the minimum amount that's due on your uh, credit card, but make sure that you are doing more than the minimum. Um, and speaking of that, I think it's important as well with regard to credit. Um, people don't want to talk about it. I say that it's a mind shift that needs to happen in our communities, much like Marcus Garvey talked about years ago. We need to have a mind shift about how we manage our resources and not living above our means. Managing our credit and understanding all the terms. Right now, there are challenging times. We hear of young people having 19% interest rates. I mean, it's outrageous. Why? Because the credit and your credit score affects you for years and years to come. Um, I was going to provide numbers for the credit bureaus, but you all can go online. Write this down if you don't know. Uh, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. <laughs> And then they go to get something, or if they need to, in some cases, if they're going to a high-cost institution, not only getting a federal loan, but getting a private loan. And once you take out a private loan, they are going to pull your credit. And they do want to know what sort of repayment history you have. I'm from California, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, I think that it's important that you make sure that you have a noted uh, way of saying, program it in your, in your calendar. Program it into your PDA so that you're, one, making sure you pay down the debts that you have. Um, specifically, make sure that you're paying more than the minimum amount that's due. And with regard to credit, checking your credit on a regular basis. Um, it will also be important that you're mindful about debt with your debit card and your credit card. You use it wisely and in only emergency situations. And again, when I was in school, I didn't have credit card. I just don't, I can't imagine that. When I worked on campus, seeing that there were credit card companies right there on campus, ready to sell to a student, uh, usually at a very high rate, be very mindful about using that credit card and that debit card for emergency purposes, for things that you need on a readily, readily needed basis. Um, also making sure that you're identifying all of the things that are there for you in your plan. So as you continue to move along in your academic career, how many people are in the sciences in here? Dying proudly. Okay, so sciences, that's high cost, right? You have all those books and lab fees and yes. additional, uh, you know, all that, right? Nodding your heads, yes. There are a lot of resources out there, and I want to give you a couple of websites that um, I think will be particularly helpful to you, um, not only in really doing what Zakia said about making sure that you are finding out about how much will it cost for you to repay a student loan once you're done with X percentage of debt, a monthly amount to fit into your budget, um, but also what can you do to be very mindful about defraying those costs with scholarships, defraying those costs with uh, independent organizations or with federal agencies that do have resources. In my case, it was doing the homework with various shops on campus that Georgetown, for example, I combed everywhere for, you know, who had public policy scholarships? Nobody. 
And when I found an organization that paid for part-time and partial scholarship, it was amazing. But I had to comb the literature. So the first resource is obviously the U.S. Department of Education. You can go to studentaid.ed.gov. If you have that already, studentaid.ed.gov. I also want you to make sure you write down finaid.org, F-I-N-A-I-D.org, finaid.org. The other website is fastweb.org, fastweb, you know, nod your heads, yes, this is good. Another is peterson's.com, peterson's, P-E-T-E-R-S-O-N-S.com. And the last one is Mapping Your Future, mappingyourfuture.org. I use all of these websites on a regular basis and have in the loan counseling that I've provided in years past, as well as to the students in the school districts where I've worked. Primarily because I think it's extremely important for people to have consistent information, all of these being online guides about repayment, about budgeting, about how to make sure that you're managing your debt wisely. With regard to mapping your future, that is a great tool for going on if you're looking at a particular career, sciences, liberal arts, to track how much it might cost and then potential earnings that you might have once you get into a particular field. As I mentioned, one of the exciting parts about being on this panel is that we've all worked together in various capacities. And what I have found most endearing is that we all are so committed to the policy aspects of this. Uh, I'm very excited to hear that the administration has a number of uh, issues on the agenda um, from a political standpoint pending in Congress, and so that there are going to be some exciting new benefits coming forth. I think more importantly, it is up to all of us, because if we don't do it, uh, and if those of us who are here able to attend a fine conference, to eat fine food, get all dressed up and go out, uh, don't think logically about how we manage, in these tough economic times, our resources, then it would be all for naught. And you can look back at yourself 10 years from now and say, wow, wasn't that great? I was attending CBC when it was over on Connecticut Avenue. Anybody else from CBC over in Connecticut? So it, it was a different day. It was much smaller. It wasn't at the convention center. And now it has gradually moved right on up. Um, with that, I will take my seat, but before doing so, I will share that one of the very exciting parts about now transitioning myself, uh, being an advocate for financial literacy, I have written a book. And my book is called Leadership Building Blocks, An Insider's Guide to Success. I took my experiences on the school board, being a relationship developer, being an advocate, being someone who is very committed to young people, and provided a toolkit for those to come behind. What good would it be for me to get elected to office at 32 and then say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't help the next person behind? And so I wrote the book, one of probably many, because now financial literacy will be to follow, uh, because I think we have expertise, each one of us. And if each one of us in here is interested in a topic such as higher education and about continuing the wealth in our communities, and we each have an obligation to tell our stories, and so with that, I'll take my seat and look forward to our dialogue and discussion. Uh, thanks, Don. Um, we got about 45 minutes left, and I'm going to use about 10, 15 minutes to ask a couple of uh, moderator-related questions, then we're going to open it up to everybody. And there'll be a wireless mic um, going around for you all to ask your own questions. Actually, uh, Don, um, I have a question related to uh, those financially, those uh, credit reports. I think I went to like freecreditreport.com, I got a bill for $15 <laughs> the next month. How do we ensure that we don't get charged for free credit reports? Certainly, is this on here? What I would encourage people to do is be very mindful about going through the main agencies that I mentioned. Uh, there are a lot of traps out there on the freeway, the super information superhighway. Uh, where you will get charged. Also, people who will charge you to fill out a FAFSA form. You should not be charged to fill out a FAFSA. You should not be charged to get your credit information. It's your information. So be very mindful of the traps. I would recommend that all and any go through their financial aid office. Um, students who are prudent will utilize that resource before. 
during and after graduation. So I would think that would be your best round. Thanks. Um, in regards to the FAFSA, um, how many people have experience completing the FAFSA? <laughs> and how many have experience having frustrations with the FAFSA? <laughs> About 100% of those who completed it. <laughs> it takes a week. It does take a week. And so what is the administration or, 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 or anybody doing to reconsider changes in the FAFSA given the complications of that form? Well, I guess I'll answer that. Since um, the same legislation that I talked about, we got a lot of stuff in that bill, um, is also seeking to simplify the FAFSA. And um, we've heard that it's a little difficult sometimes. Um, and that shouldn't be a barrier to somebody going to college. And so um, there's actually research that we draw, drew on to, to, to do this uh, kind of initiative from Bridget Terry Long, at one of my former professors at Harvard, um, showing that when people get um, help and when they pre-fill pre the tax information in the FAFSA, the remaining questions with um, it was the counselor kind of assisted are not that hard to do. And I think they did it in like seven minutes on average. So. Um, there was a project through h and Block where they already had all the information laid out there because they were people were completing their taxes. They put it in, they had a you know a thing to uh, to pre-fill it into the FAFSA so that you didn't have to look up line 28 from you know this form or whatever. And once you do that, that's really the majority of the information. So um, what we are what we are asking Congress to do is to remove because we don't actually make the, we we decide how the questions are going to be asked, but we don't decide the data items we being the Department of Education that are on the FAFSA. The Congress actually legislates every item of data by law. We have to ask that in order to, to, to determine um, how much financial aid to give it to whom. And so we're asking them to remove those data items that are not found anywhere on the tax form because that's an additional burden that, you know, we're asking something else and you don't know it's on your tax form. It's harder for us to verify. It's harder for the financial aid office to verify. And you have to go find additional documents that aren't easily on your 1040A or easy. So we're asking them to remove those so that people can fill it out with only the information that's found on their tax forms. And um, we're also working with the IRS, talk about government working together, <laughs> working with the IRS to allow people to, uh, to, um, to populate the FAFSA with information that they are, you can already have that the IRS has stored online with your tax information. I've had so many people say, you guys already have the information, we already gave it to you, we give it to so many different agencies, why can't you just work together and tell me how much money you know, I'm supposed to pay or how much money I get? Um, and that's, you know, so that's something we're, we're working on it. We also just made it look nicer because it was online before, but it just wasn't kind of spruced up. So we got, <laughs> we got it, um, you know, we're kind of with the times and the web form is going to come out July, for, uh, June, January 1st um, with a new and improved kind of look and feel. It'll be easier to navigate. You won't have 20 questions on one page. It'll use skip logic, which means if you answer a question, that means that you don't have to answer if you, if, for instance, if you say you're um, a male that's over the age of 26, you don't need to answer the question about selective service because we don't require you to register for selective service if you're under the age of 26. So the form is 99% of people do it online now, should be smart enough so that you shouldn't have to answer that question as well, making it more complicated. So there's other questions like that. There's, if you fill out a certain type of tax form, you don't have to answer an additional set of student asset questions. So we shouldn't be asking you those student asset questions if you already indicated that you filled out that type of tax form. So anyway, we're, we're making improvements, we're making it better. So hopefully if you got um, kids or students that you miss or a tutor that are filling it out post January 1st, please let us know what you think of the improved form. Now I just want to add on to that. Um, are any of you here familiar with a program called College Goals Sunday? Ever heard of that? Well, you should become familiar with it, as, and it's a shame that you don't know about it. It's not a program that my organization runs, but we actually are the evaluators of the program. And it's called College Goal Sunday because it's a, an event that's held on a Sunday right after the Super Bowl, where financial aid administrators from every state gather in various areas within that particular state. And they have students come at all levels, whether you are an undergraduate, graduate student, or an adult who just wants to take a couple of classes to get uh, reacquainted with college. They actually help you fill out the FAFSA. So it's always, the Super Bowl is what, February, I think? Yeah. Or late January, early February. So if you are going to be renewing your FAFSA application, or you have brothers, sisters, cousins, neighbors, who need to do the first round of the FAFSA, then I want to encourage you to consider that program. Literally, you can go there with a financial aid administrator from a college at your side who can help you navigate and answer every question 
on that particular form. And now that the form's going to be a little bit better, it should take no time at all and should be quite intuitive. So think about that and look and listen out for the uh, advertisements for the program. Now you'll probably pay more attention to it when you hear it again. It's called College Bowl Sunday, and it's in 36 of the 50 states. Andy C. Yes, Andy C. Ken and I used to work with that program in Nazareth. Um, my last question, I'll turn over to a question that we have in the audience, but what are some non-loan grant sources of financial aid that professional and graduate students can uh, look into? Where can they be found? <laughs> well, I think Don had some of her closing remarks sort of uh, alluded to that, and I, I'll certainly defer to her um, on, on some of the things I just wanted to start to say. I mean, the, the, the programs I'm most familiar with are in the sciences and engineering and math and, and um, things like the advanced program, AGAP, um, um, things like that, um, uh, the, the, the National Institute for Health, the, the, um, a lot of federal programs. Um, um, you know, really, I, I think a lot of for, for grad professional programs, a lot of the, the uh, fields are very specific in terms of, of, of the amount of funding that they have. So really, it's, it's, it's incumbent upon folks to do a lot of the um, research, particularly if you're at a, at a, a school that's um, in the AGEP program, which now I'm forgetting what the acronyms for them, but maybe the not to remember. Yeah, from NSF, yeah, the National Science Foundation program, yeah. Um, but I think what Don, Don's story is similar to, to, to mine in that um, um, when I was, you know, preparing for grad school, I, you know, I, 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 you know, Don and I are about the same age, back in the Stone Ages before the, the internet, and, and, um, and we did a lot of, you know, Don's story is the same as mine, you know, you kind of go to a library and, and you know, look up and, and unfortunately for me, I, I discovered um, APAN, which um, um, which paid for my the first year of my graduate study. The Association for, Association for Public Policy Analysis and Management um, has a or had I don't know if they still do but they do today um, has a uh, program for students going into public policy, which is what my my graduate degree is in. Uh, so I think it's easier now with the with the, the web and, and Google searches and things like that. So I I think if I had to give advice. I'd Start with the field with you know, engineering and then you know scholarships or fellowships from there and then see what pops up. That I, which I can be more you know, helpful in that, but I'm uh, gonna you know, turn it to Don and see what she says. Absolutely, Ken's right on. Uh, the websites I provided, I think, are the best bet to start. Um, working at Georgetown Financial Aid, the folks who got the scholarships were the ones who were calling the office to say, May I have your private scholarship list? You need to make yourself known about your interest and um, doing the research I think Ken just said about preparing. So if you want to go to high cost institution, state school, or certification program, you need to ask about do you have any specific programs for students? Don't even fill in the blank, just let them fill in the blank about what the circumstance might be. It might be part time, it might be returning. I know sometimes they have programs for students who are parents who have a student who's in college at the same time. I mean there are an unbelievable number of ways, um, but really be very specific and committed. Add it to your calendar. Spend an hour a day doing that research before you go. Um, the websites again were finding.org, um, fastweb.org, petersons.com, um, and then I encourage you to go to each of those school websites. I think it was Michelle you mentioned about going to a school where cost, you know, the package that you receive is really a determining factor. Most of my friends were going to UCLA or Cal, and I went to Howard, and Howard wasn't giving up a lot of money, you know? <laughs> and the dorms were lavish. So, you know, I mean, it was, it was not something that I took lightly, but I knew I needed to research ways to pay for that, and then also college work study. Uh, my nephew is in college right now, and he's turning his nose up saying, well, I don't have to work. And I'm like, yes, you are. You're going to do a college work study. You're going to work on campus, and that's going to help pay your bill. So how do we find creative ways, I think? The graduate is no different. Uh, it's a higher cost factor. Uh, graduate associations or national associations, like Ken mentioned, I think are a terrific resource. Um, I know at the law school, 
um, students, I think, walked out with six figures in debt. So you know, and, and now, we got a whole lawsuit. I mean, we got it right here. Yeah. <laughs> that old cloud following you around, right? But be mindful, if you're going to go in six figures in debt, really do some homework before you jump in. Um, and figure out if you want to go into public service. We have law students who go on and go into public service. You know they signed up immediately for the public service debt forgiveness program, just like Zaki is talking about. So it requires you to do some forward thinking. It's something else I, I, I would have, uh, uh, it's, you know, Don triggered something in me. Um, particularly at private institutions, uh, when I was an undergraduate at Tufts, uh, they had a whole list of scholarships that if you didn't call the financial aid office, or if someone in the financial aid office wasn't looking out for you, you, you had no idea, because they, they just didn't make those things pub public. A lot of donors and people like that start scholarships for particular types of, of students with either degree fields or things like that. So I definitely would encourage, and it's something that Don said, and I think it's very true, whether you're an undergraduate student or a graduate student, is call the financial aid office and ask them for that list of, of private, private lists. Sometimes it goes privately endowed or private scholarships because you'd be surprised. I mean, there are really a whole host of those out there. They're, they tend to be fairly small, but but you know, you know, it, 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 you know even a thousand dollars makes a difference in terms of a uh, scholarship for a student. You know, uh, uh, can make a difference between going to a particular program and going to a program. So I, I think what Don has said is, is is exactly right. And to underscore, I guess the point about um private scholarships and personal responsibility and, and looking out, I think all of us have the experience of trying to decide where to go to school based on money. I went to the school that offered me the biggest financial aid package and it ended up being a really good school. I mean, it was a good school, but that wasn't like a huge, huge burden, but I had my sights set on a different school. I had them set for bad reasons. I was a basketball friend and I wanted to go to Duke, but you know. <laughs> but I still really wanted to go there and they just did not give me any money. And I called the aid office, I was like, excuse me, did you see the maps that I sent? I don't know. Um, and I, it was a scholarship that I didn't know about at my, my institution, Vanderbilt. But I, I say that to say there's the sticker price and the net price. So I don't want us to be, uh, when we talk to our students and when we apply to college and you know, counsel students, a lot of private institutions actually have more institutional aid that they might be able to give out. So in some instances for certain people, it might be less expensive to go. It would have been more expensive for me, honestly, to go to the University of Georgia than it would have been to go to the, uh, to the school that I went to. Because UGA, even though we have a whole scholarship in Georgia, I would have still been paying for uh, tuition and fees. And at Vanderbilt, I would pay zero. Like, I didn't pay anything. And I got money back after, um, you know, some, from some working on campus and things like that. So. Just to know the difference between sticker price versus the actual price that you may pay, which you don't know out no until you fill out the FAFSA and whatever other financial aid information that you need to give. And then um, on the graduate student front, this is something that we've heard a lot. I mean, from the department's perspective, from the administration perspective, we honestly don't do a lot of direct funding to students for graduates from the Department of Education. There are other, you know, NIH, which is huge grant um, resources. But even still, a lot of those grants go to institutions who then give the grants to students. So you would still need to, to be in contact with the institution about the grant opportunities that are there. We give out some grants, but we give those to institutions, you know, for like, um, you know, for, for things where you would have to go through your institution to apply for like a Fulbright or something like that, that we give for graduate studies. So that's kind of why I was like less, like, oh, you know, I know the things that we give to like different types of institutions, but that's not necessarily going to help you if you don't go to that institution and major in that, that program. And I just want to add, uh, the idea about being very creative. Don mentioned creativity. I went through graduate school uh, when I got a master's degree that was on a fellowship but I still had to take out some loans and so when I went to go for a PhD and I knew that it was going to be an extended amount of time, I didn't want to take out the kind of loans that I had to take out to get the master's program, but recognizing that I was going to have to take out some. So I approached my employer and I asked them how could they help me and because I was at a moment of desperation, that was my last option. I had already looked through the employee handbook. It said absolutely nothing about helping pay for college. But, you know, I really wanted to work there. I really enjoyed working there. And I also wanted to go to school. And I had this decision. Either I was going to have to quit my job and get an assistantship that paid half of what my job paid, or I was going to have to figure things out. So I talked to my employer. And sure enough, they helped me. They helped. Um, now, sometimes we're in situations where your employer can't do that or they can't um, 
They don't necessarily support you and your educational goals, but you have to think creatively. And the strategy that I used with my employer was very complicated. Very, very, very complicated. But it required, I really thought out the box. I, I went and talked to people in finance, like, how can we make this work? And they sat down and they made it help. They helped me make it work. Why did they do that? They didn't like me working there. They wanted me to stay. And they knew that me and this degree would be, could be the thing that could make me leave. Now, eventually I did leave, but. <laughs> <laughs> you made sure you got your money back, you <laughs> Their money's worth too. I, but I am, I'm in a situation now where, and I can say this is a very current situation. I'm now running an organization. I have an extremely valuable employee who came to me and said, I want to pursue a master's degree. And I'm trying to figure out how to make this work. Well, I'm going to try to help her figure out how to make it work, too. Because her advancing her education and taking that class helps her, but it also helps I help. So don't be afraid to have those kind of conversations. Somebody might tell you no, but they also might say, well, let's see what we can do. So just take that as an option as well. Thank you. Um, we provided information, the panelists have provided information about three distinct yet interrelated areas. Uh, one in college, uh, college financing and college funding, another with the ed education uh, administration is doing, and kind of personal responsibility from, from Don. So thanks for all that. Um, we have about 25 minutes to take any questions, and um, if you can kind of limit your, specify your question or comment, and then if we can take to a couple minutes to respond to each question or less. Do we have a wireless mic? Um, one, I would just like to say that I commend the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation for having this forum, and I was so excited when I saw all the people in the room at the beginning, because this really is a huge issue, and I don't think people realize um, the dynamic of funding for education. But I would also like to say that my name is Tiffany Marcel, and I'm the chair of the National Black Law Students Association, and a lot of students in the room, and some who have left, are from the Black Law Students Association. and. Um, as lawyers or future lawyers, we understand the importance of um, funding for education, more particularly the fact that we accrue a large amount of debt. And a lot of us, especially now because of the economy and realizing that big law firm life is not necessarily the lifestyle that we want to live and we want to do something that we might feel may have more of a public benefit, um, can't afford to do that right now. And while I commend the Department of Education and I commend President Brock and Michelle for their endeavors in trying to um, expand um, the federal side of things. What about the private side? It's being left out dramatically. Uh, we had a student rally on two days ago at Job Marshall Park advocating on behalf that the private sector of student loans right now is leaning more towards predatory lending than actually funding for education because um, there's no cap in the rates. They don't have flexible repayment. Um, flexible repayment um, policies like the federal ones do. Um, like she was saying, 20 to, the, 20 to 30 percent annual percentage rate on student loans is astronomical. People can't afford to do that. And then you all were talking about forbearance and deferment. Well, with the private loans, those lapse really early and you have to pay a fee just to initiate those. These are all concerns that we all experience and are really considering when we graduate in the next couple of years, not knowing where we're going to work because the economy is bad. And then six months later, Sally Mae or whoever else is coming knocking at our door wanting their money. We don't have any options. So what is it that, the, that you all who um, are talking about all these policy initiatives would advise us into trying to get Congress or whoever else we need to be more proactive in um, re reformation of the private lending? Thank you. I'll start, um, I'll start by saying in terms of me, because of my position, I can't tell you what you could do with Congress, but I can tell you what uh, the rest of us can tell you. The rest of them can tell you. <laughs> and I can tell you what some concerns are that I've heard about. Um, you know, and I think everything you said is the nail right on the head. And you're completely, absolutely right that from our perspective, uh, what we can, what we have control of, direct control of, is our programs and obviously federal student loans. So from our perspective, we also see a lot of students, not usually the graduate students, but sometimes, but undergraduate students who take out private loans before they take out federal loans, not understanding that private loans don't have as many protections. And so they're left in a situation where they could have had their maximum in federal loans 
but for whatever reason, a lot of times because private loans you don't have to fill out a FAFSA, they'll just say, you know, sign your, your life over and, you know, we'll give it to you, you can call this number. Um, and, and so they, they get those loans without having taken out their full eligibility of, of federal loans. So we always say federal loans first. Make sure you've maxed out your federal loan um, limits. And now we've got, um, you know, some things like Grad Plus where you can take out, you know, the cost of attendance essentially for it as a, in a, as a, that's a newer, a newer thing, but for certainly for everybody here, as a graduate student, you can take out federal loans for the cost of attendance up to, up to the federal loan limit, which depending on which graduate field of study, I mean, for medical students, it's like $230,000 or something like that, they're, they're, mat, they're adding to loan limit. So I would say federal loans first, always, always investigate to make sure that you're taking out the maximum amount of federal loans. And then there was a, a hearing, we haven't taken a position on this, but I would say there was a hearing. Um, the other day um, that uh, Congressman, uh, Chairman uh, Conyers had, talking about private student loans and being able to discharge them in bankruptcy, you know, I mean, you're there, all right, so um, I just thought that might be interesting. Well, I'll also add in my organization, we're, to, we're about to embark upon a study on private loans. Uh, we did a couple already, and this time what we're trying to do, and the reason it's a little bit difficult, is we're actually trying to get a database of private loan uh, borrowers. And we're running into a little snag with the student loan, or the bank really wanted to give us that access to that database. Um, and you can probably imagine why. But we're hoping to shine some more light on what's happening there, and then that kind of information can be used to inform the decisions that the administration and other uh, bodies are trying to make in this regard. But I also want to say for lawyers in particular, and this is a, a true story, I have a friend, he is a lawyer, uh, and he was general counsel at Morgan State for many years, and so he wasn't making a lot of money, but he made a, a good, mm -hmm. decent salary. And he recently, about three years ago, decided he wanted to go into the ministry. But was challenged by this because he had all of the student loan debt. Mm -hmm. And um, he finally decided to make that shift, but Sally May kept coming at the door, and he's making substantially less money. And I told him, you know, you need to look into the income based repayment program. And he was nervous. He said he called the department. Nobody was able to help him. And finally said, well, let me call with you, because you might be asking the wrong questions. And I was on the phone with him when they told him what his payment would be, because he's now in this public service loan forgiveness program because of his profession now. But he still has those law school loans. And believe me when I say that program makes a difference in what he was going to pay Sally Mae and what he's now going to have to pay the Department of Education. Huge difference. And I agree with that. The only thing is with private loans, they don't count. Private loans, it doesn't count. count. The interest and yeah. um, you're accruing that interest at 20%. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen. Right, and that's why I think programs like what Zakia was talking about, making sure that students, you, you're absolutely right. It does, private loans is a different beast, mm -hmm. and, and it really is a beast. Um, but that's why making sure that you take advantage of all of the federal programs first before you take and embark upon the private loans. And I think a lot of times students don't know about all of the available options that are available to them through the federal government. And then they go in, in, into these risky agreements with the banks. And once you enter that, it's really, really tough to break away from that. You're absolutely correct. Next question. Um, I see. Good afternoon. Um, I actually have a couple of comments as well. My name is Karen Wright Moore, and I, I'm a veteran higher education professional. I've been managing Title IV student financial aid programs for um, um, over 20 years. Let me just say that. I won't tell you how many. Um, but I'm encouraged, and I'm also discouraged because when you made mention of how many of you know about um, College Bowl Sunday and nobody knew about it, I mean, the problems that the, the this audience discussed today are critical. I mean, it's it's serious, particularly at the campus level and on college campuses nationwide. These are daily issues that our students deal with. But I'm also discouraged because they still, at this level, don't really truly understand what's available to them, what they have access to, what to do about scholarship searches. And I'm just wondering. I have a, I have a couple of comments also. I'm just wondering, at what point will we ever standardize some way to, um, to distribute the information to students earlier? I can't tell you. Um, I actually have challenged each of my colleagues in, in the financial aid industry to take that personal time and take our president's call and use it as a volunteer mechanism 
<clears throat> to research scholarships for particular students. There's a profile form, tell me what you do, tell me what you like, tell me what your hobbies are, tell me what you're focusing on, tell me what area of the country you want to go to school in, and I'll help you validate some of those scholarships. Because sometimes it's almost like throwing it up against the wall and we'll see what sticks. Because there's so much data out there, and for everything that they have to do, they just don't have the time to do it. So, um, twofold, the private loan industry is critical because the, the data that we have regarding the debt that students graduate with, it is for federal loans only. And as we know, the gap between federal loans and the cost of tuition is growing steadily. So the only options that they have without researching these scholarship programs are these private lenders, and you're right, they are becoming predatory, particularly since so many of them got washed out of the industry just a little bit over a year ago with, with the fall of the student loan industry. Um, and I guess the other question that I have is, some of the data that you have indicated that even in grad school, the majority of those students are um, studying um, education, getting their master's in education. And we know that African Americans are the largest percentage of students taking out student loans. So, I mean, everybody knows that there's somebody in our family that's a teacher. So have we ever determined whether or not there's a correlation between the teacher loan debt forgiveness program and African Americans that are going into teaching? And if so, how do we get that information to students in the middle school level? Because I can't tell you how many students come to me to help me, to ask me to help them find scholarships, but it's like January of their senior year. It's right. too late. So at what point do you, how do we start getting that information to students earlier um, in some standardized way? And how do we partner with the K-12 industry, higher education and K-12, to disseminate this information earlier? For example, some of the debt forgiveness that, um, I live in New Jersey, at the state level we were trying to, um, get some of our graduate students to work in high schools um, and private citizens were forgiving some of their debt if they taught high school students about financial aid, about the application process, about what to expect. So those are some of the pilot programs, but I'd really be interested in, that, in knowing what we're doing to get this information to them earlier because these are law school students, there's college students, there's parents in here, and grade school is just not too early in my opinion. You know, I, would, I would definitely say there are a couple of ways. I think each of us has an obligation uh, to be involved on a personal level, mm -hmm. as you just mentioned, within mm -hmm. our families and in our communities. Uh, late Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill, had a phrase called, in the book actually came out, all politics is local. And we've all heard that phrase, all politics is local. This is politics. This is about scarce resources. Who has access to education? Who has access to maintain a degree of wealth? You're completing law degrees, and you're going to get out of school and maybe be challenged because of the economy, challenged because of debt, and challenged trying to do something you may love and can't afford to do it. So it is a critical time for each of us to take that obligation seriously, that it starts with each of us in a local way. I would implore each of us not only to take this information back to our respective organizations or for ourselves, but to share it in part. One of the things that I did, and, and I saw other people do it, which was, I wasn't reinventing the wheel. I'm a PK, pastor's kid, many times over. My grandfather was very instrumental in Philadelphia to get out in the community and spread the word. It's just that simple. So get out into church groups, fraternities and sororities, partner together, talk to the financial aid offices. As a school board member, my job was to make sure we kept those programs, the college level program, awareness, access, the college goal Sunday program that Michelle talked about, the financial aid resources, that it was not just distributed in one part of town, but it was in every part of town. And so we all have an obligation to work with our community-based organizations, to work with our faith-based organizations. If you're in a sorority or fraternity or a civic group, make a suggestion that at the next meeting you do something. Each of us can't expect it to be, oh, someone else is going to start this program for us. Start where you are. 
Um, one of the things I think that is uh, really, I think, amazing is we all said we're all from you know, mainstream organizations. Obviously, what the CDC is doing in hosting the session is instrumental. There should be a list going around and everybody start to have a mobilization because this is the work we've all talked about and done in one way or another, the grassroots. That's the way things have always been done with African Americans from a grassroots perspective. I think um, just from the, I think there's a common theme that's been talked about with a couple of the questions and that's about um, a compilation of where can I find getting information early. And I think that's really critical. Uh, something that's dear to my heart, the last one of the, one of the first things I actually, Michelle hired me at the advisory committee. And she put me on this report that I had to research information about getting information to students about financial aid early. It was titled Early and Often. Early and Often, <laughs> financial aid information. You tell them early, but they'll forget. So you tell them often about um, you know, the resources that are available. Um, and it had recommendations and things like that for Department of Education to do. So now I guess I should be thinking about the other side. And I, I think, honestly, that's, um, I guess, what I'm getting to is that we should, and we are, um, we, you know, we've got a lot of pots on, on the burner or uh, things on the stove. But one of the things that we are starting to think about and that um, I guess I welcome um, more feedback about is how do we, we get information in a standardized way to students at an early level um, at, you know, in middle school or, or earlier about what their options are, about the things that we do. It's harder, you know, we get lawyers getting pesky questions about it. We provide information about private scholarships or church scholarships that we can't verify or we don't know if it's a scam or whatever. But at least for the things that we offer so that there shouldn't be a ton of different programs um, um, around the different administration um, departments that people don't know about, there should be a, a way. And furthermore, we already know what, who's, who needs the information, um, at least with the FAFSA. And that's one thing, I mean, it's later on because you're not filling that out until you're a senior. Um, so, you know, we've got to figure out how do we get to people before they fill out a FAFSA. And, you know, they've got the FAFSA forecast where we can at least find out how much federal aid, uh, you know, what your federal gifts would be. But one thing that we did change, and it's a very small change, and it doesn't get at the level that we need to talk about, is this, it was the SAR, the student aid report. So when you fill out the FAFSA, what pops up, you should be just your EFC. And that can be pretty depressing. <laughs> you just put in all this information. It doesn't tell you how much you get. It tells you... It's not how much you owe, but it is perceived as how much you owe. Um, and we can, and we, it's a simple calculation, simple enough, to be able to tell you if you're eligible for a Pell Grant, if you went full time, this is how much you would get. Um, and, you know, we, we um, thought about putting how much you were eligible for in loan limits, but we're thinking about, you know, are people borrowing too much or whatever. We have links to, these are the other uh, things that we have about loans and things like that. So at least when people fill out the FAFSA, they don't just get how much they owe, they also now find out how much they will receive. We have about um, 12 minutes left, and uh, how many questions do we have? <laughs> Alright, so limit your, what you have to say to a question. Um, please don't comment unless it contextualizes your question to make sense. And let your question not be longer than 20 words, so it will be under 20 seconds. But I always say, Rob, go and stick around and talk to people. Okay, great, great. So those who, can, who are able to stick around, please hold your questions to the end. For those who cannot or have a burning question that's relevant for the larger audience, um, please keep your hands raised. Yeah, could I make one quick comment about uh, what you said in terms of um, getting information to students early about financial literacy and things like that? There's there's an organization that I think is still around called the Jumpstart Coalition, which is which is an excellent example of what they're trying to do is trying to get <coughs> uh, yeah, information about borrowing, who use a credit card debt to kids in middle school. And I think, you know, going to their, they, I think, have created a model for how it can be done. Uh, the problem is, I mean, you know, to, to be honest, you know, our, our, our country, we, we've been, um, we're great at spending. We're not very good at educating people how to save. And, and, and I think it starts with things like the Jump Start Cruise to try to turn that around. But check out their website. I think it's just jumpstartcoalition.org. And at least it gives you a template of what you can do. It is what Don I think what Don said is very critical as well. Hello. Um, I also want to thank you all for being here. I'm one of the ones in the audience today who I am a current college student. I'm a second semester junior at Duquesne University. And I am from Prince George's County, so I kind of represent not only myself but my friends as well. And the problem that we're running into is the fact that we'll fill out the FAFSA, but the difference is the actual, even though income that our parents are coming in is high, but the actual living 
wage and what we're actually working with is less. So then at my university, um, I get eligible for work study, I get the uh, federal loan, but then when I take the position as the RA, resident assistant on my campus, they take away my eBay's money. Mm -hmm. So then I run into that problem. So then I can't work on campus. Mm -hmm. So then, what am I to do when I live, I go to a school in a city like Pittsburgh where you have to have a car in order to get a job, and then on top of that, the living wage is less, so I can't pay for my private education. So the problem I have is with the FAFSA starting off the process, saying that my mother's supposed to pay basically over $20,000 a year for education, and still living in this French or this county area, and being a single, coming from a single parent household, she makes enough money on paper, but as far as actually paying tuition, it's not happening. And then speaking on the other friends I have are in school, we run in situations, we make it into school, we start off with the money, but they don't adjust their money either. So then my question is for Ken Red, how do you approach that the, the financial aid office? Because I know calling doesn't work because they'll sit and they'll talk on the phone and not get to us. And then when I go meet with I demand to meet my financial advisor, she doesn't know what she's talking about. So then I, I mean it's just it's just a situation that we're dealing with. So then she knows she doesn't know numbers. I'm a business student. I know more about numbers than she does. And then so you want to speak to the person who actually makes the decision, but they're worrying about the bills that they have for the school. So what's the tactful way to talk to them, tell them what you're giving me is not enough and what you're taking away is too much? Sure. No, I, I'm, I'm good at I, I will start, but other panelists can jump in. Um, I'm going to go back to my, my days when I worked for the financial aid administrators. Association. Um, I always told people the, the best way to talk to financial aid. Financial aid is, as you as you allude to, is very lingo oriented. Um, so I always tell people the, the key words to use when I'm talking to a financial aid administrator is, is you know, either the word professional judgment or negotiate. Um, professional judgment basically just. They both are kind of similar, but professional judgment it means that each each institution has the a flexibility to adjust an aid package for a student who is in a situation such as you're talking about. Um, I think the reason why I mean I, I don't know the percent you can't you can't I'm not gonna I, I I can't comment on whether what she did was was good or bad, but but I think one of the problems with financial aid in general um, is that that. Um, uh, Aid administrators obviously are, are, are just like a lot of people who work under stress and things like that. So, so they're going to gravitate for the people who they think can sympathize with them. And so I think when you start giving them the same lingo that they would use back um, and just say, well, you know, I know you have the ability to use professional judgment and here is my situation, uh, that at least starts a conversation on a more sympathetic um, and uh, uh, basis. Um, I don't know Duquesne in terms of their their funding levels and things not, like that. Just, I don't want to right. really Duquesne, but it's right. private private schools private, in yeah. general. Yes, private schools. It's private private schools in general. One of the advantages of a private institution is that <coughs> um, oftentimes they have some money for which they have a little bit more flexibility to use. It, it's not like a, a they don't have the same types of restrictions as some public institutions may have. So I, I think in that way, in that case, you're at a slight advantage. But as you as you said, I mean, you know, like, yeah. the best I, other than what I just said, the best I can do is is is, is say you're doing the right thing. You're just being persistent. I think the, hopefully with what I advise in terms of, of you know using some key phrases and things like that might help. So. Jackie Bird, she was the one who gave me the bone marrow transplant. Save a life while you can in your lifetime.